All right, so in this lecture, we're going to talk some more about the development of the colonies in the 17th century. When it came to the North American colonies, when it came to their ties to England, uh, in a lot of ways, they had cut their ties to England by setting out on their own. And actually, their biggest trading partner were the Dutch colonies in the Caribbean. And so... Starting in 1651, the English Parliament passed a series of laws that collectively are known as the Navigation Acts to try to give them control over commerce in their colonies. The first Navigation Act was passed in 1651. Uh, that was under the Rump Parliament under Oliver Cromwell. And it gave Parliament authority to regulate British trade. Now, of course, that law got overturned when the Restoration began in 1660, but the Navigation Act of 1660 was probably the most important piece of parliamentary legislation passed in the era prior to the Seven Years' War. Uh, the Navigation Act of 1660 stated that if you were going to trade in an English colony or an English colonial port, you had to have a crew that was at least 75% English. You had to have a ship that was built in either England or the colonies and that certain goods of great value could only be traded with either England or another English colony. Uh, these included tobacco, rice, so the things that were produced in the colonies. And again, these navigation acts are attempts to eliminate trade with the Dutch. The Staple Act of 1663 expanded the navigation acts. And the new taxes imposed by the Navigation Acts hit small planters in the Chesapeake the hardest. But there were loopholes. Although you did have to sell your goods to England, um, you did not have to pay English taxes on them unless you sold them there. And so American ships would often make for the Caribbean and sell their goods there, tax-free. Uh, they could fulfill the letter of the law, uh, while circumventing the spirit. Well, the Parliament fixed that loophole in 1673 when they passed the Navigation Act of that year. They imposed plantation duties, which were the equivalent of English customs duties, in all of the colonial ports, so that now you could not escape your taxes. And the profit margin, the motivation for trading in the Caribbean, was suddenly gone. The Parliament appointed a Board of Trade in London to oversee uh, the enforcement of the Navigation Acts, and the result was the Anglicization of the colonies. That is, as the colonies began to trade more and more exclusively with England, with the mother country, they became more and more English. Now, this was a double-edged sword. On one hand, they felt more loyalty to the mother country, but on the other hand, they also expected to be treated like full English citizens, and of course the Parliament and the King did not treat them as full English citizens because they were in fact colonists. And so you're going to see the conflict caused by the Anglicization of the colonies all the way up to the time of the American Revolution. Meanwhile, there was a great deal of unrest in Virginia. As the contracts of many of the indentured servants began to run out, they, become, they became landless men uh, with really, really no prospects in Virginia. And enter Nathaniel Bacon. He's a wealthy Englishman who came to the Virginia colony. He hoped to be included in the inner circle of the royal governor, Governor Sir William Berkeley, but Berkeley rejected him. And as early as the 1660s, the Virginians had been at war. Uh, earlier, they had been at war with the Powhatan Confederacy. Now they're at war with tribes like the Doeg tribe, as well as the Susquehannock and so, in 1675, the Doeg tribe began raiding in Virginia, and there were a group of farmers, many of them former indentured servants, who wanted to retaliate against the Doegs. Governor Berkeley refused. Nathaniel Bacon raised a small militia anyway against the governor's wishes. They marched in and uh, burned some Doeg villages marched all the way into Maryland and attacked the Susquehannock too. Uh, they came back. Berkeley still refused to retaliate against the Doegs. And so Bacon launched a rebellion 
against the governor, and it resulted in full civil war in Virginia from July to October of 1676. And Bacon and his small army actually captured and burned Jamestown, the colonial capital, forced Governor Berkeley to flee. But in October of 1676, Bacon died of dysentery, and his little rebellion uh, disappeared. Uh, the governor came back, resumed his power in office, and long term, uh, 12 of the ringleaders of Bacon's rebellion were also executed for taking part in the rebellion, including my 10 greats grandfather, but hey, that's the way history goes. Uh, the long term, the effect that Bacon's rebellion had is that it prompted Virginians to stop importing indentured servants whose contracts would someday expire. Instead, they began passing laws like the Virginia Slave Codes of 1705 that codified the place of enslaved Africans in Virginia uh, and put into place all the characteristics of slavery that we came to know in Virginia in the period before the American Civil War. And so they began importing enslaved Africans as opposed to indentured servants because they could keep them in slavery in perpetuity as opposed to the indentured servants who might someday become free, become discontented, and you know launch a rebellion like the one under Nathaniel Bacon. So Bacon's rebellion should be seen as a class conflict and also as a precipitating factor in speeding up the process of entrenching African slavery in Virginia. Meanwhile, there was a great deal of upheaval in New England as well, and it began with Metacomet, the chief of the Wampanoag tribe that the colonists called King Philip. Now, at that time, uh, as the Puritans tried to convert some of the Wampanoags to Christianity, uh, they set them up as they converted into villages that were called Indian Christian villages. Well, one morning they found two of the members of one of these villages murdered. They assumed the Wampanoags had done it, and they kidnapped and murdered two Wampanoag warriors in retaliation. At that point, Metacomet launched a war on the English colonists. The Narragansetts also joined in this war with the Wampanoags. And over the course of what was known as King Philip's War, most of which was fought in 1675 and 1676, 800 colonists and 3,000 Native Americans were killed in the fighting. The crops and the economy were ruined. Metacomet himself was killed in battle on August 12, 1676. And after they killed him, uh, the Puritans had him drawn and quartered. They had his legs and arms sent to the four corners of the colony to warn against future rebellions or revolts. And they put his head on a pike and displayed it on the wall of the fort in Plymouth, Massachusetts for the next 20 years. And at one point, the Puritan minister, Increase Mather, actually removed the lower jawbone of the skull of Metacomet to prevent what he called, quote, the devil speaking from the grave, end quote. But in this King Philip's War, this was the first time that Americans in New England cooperated on a military basis. There was a mandatory draft of all military age men in the English colonies in New England. And they began to form a separate identity of themselves as New Englanders, separate from England. And of course, this is an identity that would carry on to the time of the American Revolution and aid in the uh, the uh, fight, uh, shaping the ideologies that led to the American Revolution. You can see an image here of the Puritans uh, forming uh, volunteers while they try to uh, push the women and children to safety. And uh, an image there, bottom of the Wampanoags and Aragonists that's burning uh, one of the small villages near Boston. Meanwhile, the Glorious Revolution had ripple effects in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. For some time, Anglican merchants had become a thorn in the side of Congregationalists in, in Boston, and so there was a brewing conflict there between the Anglicans and the Congregationalists. And then in 1684, the Catholic King James II annulled the had the Court of Chancery in London annul the Massachusetts Bay Company 
and fold Massachusetts in with the other New England colonies into what became known as the Dominion of New England in 1686. And of course, they hated this. Remember, the New England colonies had all split apart because of their religious differences. And James II appointed Sir Edmund Andrews as the royal governor. Andrews was imperious. Uh, the Bostonians hated him. He was a staunch Anglican, and so they came to suspect that he was in league with the other Anglican merchants. And when word of the Glorious Revolution got to Boston in early 1689, the Bostonians decided to stage their own version of the Glorious Revolution, and they threw Andrews out of office. He did escape capture for some time, but finally they did capture him and send him back to England for trial. And the new King William III, rather than punish the Bostonians, granted them a new royal charter for the province of Massachusetts. And it became the province of Massachusetts all the way up until the time of the American Revolution. But this is how the Bostonians reacted to the Glorious Revolution. If King William and Queen Mary could overthrow their despot, King James II, the Bostonians could certainly overthrow their despot in their eyes, Sir Edmund Andrews. And you can see Sir Edmund Andrews there. And then on the bottom, a, a statement on April 18th, 1689, basically telling Andrews to resign or they were going to come for him, which in fact they did. Meanwhile, one of the other ripple effects from all of this upheaval in New England, first you have King Philip's War, then you have the overthrow of Edmund Andrews, is the Salem Witchcraft Trials. Now, contrary to popular belief, people had been tried and executed for witchcraft in early New England, and so this was not unusual in that sense. It was unusual, though, in the way that it played out. In 1691 in Salem Village, uh, you began to have some girls who claimed that they were afflicted by witchcraft, and they exhibited strange symptoms, uh, they at first blamed uh, Tichuba, who was a, a Native American woman from the Caribbean, who was the slave of uh, the town's minister, Paris. But things quickly got out of hand. There was already a lot of conflict in Salem Village between Salem Town and Salem Village. There were a lot of competing land claims, and so this was rife for abuse. By June of 1692, they had convened a special court. Uh, in the end, over 300 individuals were accused of witchcraft. And perhaps most troubling was the court's acceptance of spectral evidence. Uh, spectral evidence uh, being the visions or the dreams of the witnesses against the accused. And this was used as evidence at court to convict them. And so you have the spectral evidence and they end up uh, convicting uh, a number of people, a number of whom end up being executed. One of the things I should mention about the Salem Witchcraft Trials is that this is not at all unusual. If you look at the previous crises that New England had faced, both in terms of King Philip's War and the overthrow of Governor Andrews, they interpreted all of these things in spiritual terms. They believed that Satan was attacking them first through Metacomet, and we saw that evidenced when Increase Mather removed his lower jawbone from the skull of the body. Uh, they believed that Sir Edmund Andrews was part of a popish plot or a Catholic plot to oppress them. And so it's not unusual that they would view any sort of abnormality in behavior as witchcraft or in spiritual terms. But at Proctor's Ledge, outside Salem, in 1692 and 1693, they hanged 19 women. One man was pressed to death. At least five people died in prison. And so at least 25 deaths resulted from the Salem witchcraft trials, until finally Increase Mather and other congregational ministers stepped in to stop the violence. And even Increase Mather eventually came to object to the use of spectral evidence at court. 
And so there are all these rumors about people being burned at the stake. There was nothing like that. They were hanged. One was pressed to death and, you know, several died in jail. And, but this was the end result of the Salem witchcraft trials. Gradually, the uh, hysteria died down, but uh, this is uh, the results of those trials. The Glorious Revolution also had ripple effects in New York as well. Uh, when Lieutenant Governor Francis Nicholson, who was in command uh, in New York, learned of the uprising in Boston, he didn't immediately announce what had happened. Uh, Jacob Leisler, a leader of the local militia, uh, rose up in rebellion in 1689 against Nicholson and overthrew him. And when Henry Slaughter was appointed governor of New York by the new King William III, he arrived in March of 1691. Leisler demanded to see proof that Slaughter had been sent from King William and not from King James, the deposed King James. Ultimately, Slaughter uh, did lay siege to Leisler and his men, and Leisler was captured and executed. Meanwhile, events also in Maryland took a turn for the worse. After the Glorious Revolution, the Protestant Association there forced the Catholic governor of the colony, William Joseph, to resign. And the Protestants began petitioning King William III to turn Maryland into a royal colony. During this time, they excluded Catholics from holding public office, and as a result, Charles Calvert, the third Lord Baltimore, lost his family's control of his colony. In 1691, uh, King William III turned Maryland into a royal colony, and this was actually the end of religious tolerance in Maryland uh, up until the time of the American Revolution. After this, Catholics were not allowed to vote or hold office. So ironic for a colony that was begun as a, a safe haven for Catholics. And you can see a map of the colonies on the right, and on the bottom right you can see an image of Jacob Leisler, the militia leader, somewhat in the mold of Nathaniel Bacon, who led a rebellion and ended up being executed 